Boa tarde a todos. Acho que vamos dar início a esta sessão com o escritor Anif Kureshi. Eu vou começar por dizer algumas palavras sobre, sobre ele e sobre a obra dele em português e depois faremos uma conversa em inglês com um período na parte final, uma conversa de cerca de uma hora, na qual estará incluído um período em que a audiência poderá fazer perguntas uh, em inglês. Uh, a não ser que não consigam falar inglês, nesse caso eu farei a tradução. A carreira de Anif Kureshi tem 30 anos, uh, 30 anos uh, dos quais ele se orgulha de ter construído uma carreira literária uh, desde muito novo. Nasceu em Bromley, nos arredores de Londres, nos subúrbios de Londres, de uma mãe inglesa e de um pai uh, um, indiano, vindo de Bombaí, mas de uma família abastada de Madras. Uh, o tema do subúrbio e da adolescência passada no, num subúrbio, aliás, o Bromley é curiosamente o mesmo sítio onde nasceu David Bowie, o David Bowie que faz a música, o soundtrack uh, de um dos uh, filmes e livros de Anif Kureishi. E essa adolescência passada a ver televisão e a ler livros foi parte do alimento daquilo que definiu, ou viria a definir, o escritor. Os grandes temas que lhe são atribuídos são normalmente os problemas de, da identidade, da intimidade, da raça, da biografia, da memória e da interação uh, entre as pessoas, ou seja, uh, do, da superação da solidão, do isolamento e, por outro lado, do sentido de uh, deslocação, uh, que ele conhecia melhor que ninguém, sendo ele mesmo um, um, uma pessoa de uh, raças misturadas, e traduzo literalmente o termo. Numa altura em que não havia uh, na Grã-Bretanha, uh, uh, nem no mundo, uma literatura uh, pós-colonial, ou seja, ainda não tinham aparecido nem sequer Naipaul. Naipaul é provavelmente o primeiro a aparecer, mas não tinham aparecido Salman Rushdie e hoje mais uh, recentemente nomes como Zadie Smith, que é aliás uma uh, escritora muito influenciada por uh, Anif Kureishi. São, estão traduzidos em Portugal vários uh, livros dele, uh, o álbum negro, o, o seu primeiro romance, O Buda uh, do Subúrbio, O Corpo, O Dom de Gabriel, No Colo do Pai e o último, que é um romance, Tenho Algo a Te Dizer. Estes são os livros que estão traduzidos em português. São livros que lidam com os temas de que eu vos falei, lidam também com o tema da família e da apropriação do escritor da sua história pessoal e da sua própria relação, neste caso a relação dele com o pai, o pai foi um uh, funcionário uh, uh, que durante muito tempo escreveu para a gaveta, ou seja, foi um escritor uh, frustrado e, 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 como o próprio Kureishi disse, era alguém que tinha da literatura a ideia de que a literatura era algo uh, uh, em que se escreviam palavras a Tolstoy, a Tchekov, a Dostoevsky. E quando o filho começou a escrever e a ter notoriedade e depois aclamação como escritor, o pai achava que os temas deles, que eram a cultura pop, o sexo, as drogas, o rock and roll, além daqueles grandes temas de que eu falei, que eram os temas um pouco sujos e, e não dignos da literatura. E deste desentendimento, claro que como um escritor é um vampiro de tudo aquilo que o rodeia, deste próprio desentendimento o, o, o escritor uh, acabou por uh, escrever livros. A relação de Kureishi com o teatro, ele começou, ele foi writer in residence da Royal Court, com o teatro, com a escrita de argumentos, com adaptações de filmes seus. Eu creio que acabaram de ver um, que é o My Beautiful Laundrette, e de séries de, tiradas de, de, de livros seus, bem como de filmes que ele próprio realizou e de, e de peças que ele ensinou, fazem com que ele seja um escritor singular, porque é alguém que, trabalhando na solidão, e tendo um, um, uma ideia muito precisa do que é o trabalho uh, do escritor, que é um trabalho, um filho dele a certa altura que lhe diz se ele todos os dias vai para aquela cadeira no escritório e tudo o que ele faz é escrever, isso aquilo é que é um trabalho, isso é um verdadeiro trabalho. E ele diz que sim, é isso que os escritores fazem, mas ele é um escritor que gosta do coletivo e gosta da relação com 
uh, o, os realizadores de cinema e tem aliás uma, uma, uma belíssima peça que eu recomendo, que está online no site uh, do Anif Kureishi, em que ele descreve a sua relação com o realizador uh, Patrice Chirot durante as filmagens de intimacy, intimidade. Portanto, esse interesse coletivo uh, dado pelo teatro e pelo cinema de que ele gosta e a solidão uh, da escrita uh, e esses temas de que eu falei há pouco e que vou retomar agora na conversa com o Kureishi construíram a biografia literária deste escritor. A partir de agora, vamos começar a falar em inglês. Hanif Kureishi, thanks for being here. Thank you, Clara. You are now... Um, an acclaimed man of letters, a very successful man of letters. You are a commander of the British Empire. I suppose you no longer feel the anger, uh, the boredom, uh, the loneliness, and the sense of displacement you had when you started writing or when you were a teenager and you thought you could probably be, become a writer and that would give you an identity. So what feeds your writing these days? Because you are a happy man, you have a happy family, beautiful children, you live in a beautiful house. How do you feed yourself? <laughs> Clara, you know me better than I know myself. <laughs> um, I think as you get older, you still want to be an artist. Uh, when I think of my friends who are uh, painters or film directors or psychoanalysts or poets, they're still working, they're still working as hard if not harder, when they're older than they, as they were when they were young, and you still have that passion. Um, my dear friend Stephen Frears made fil two films this year, I, and he's still working tonight, and he'll be working tomorrow and on Monday. Um, it's, what else would you do all day? There isn't anything else, and you still haven't said it. There are new things to say. Uh, when I was young, I wrote about being young, and now I'm middle-aged or approaching older age, as it were. There are still things I want to say about, um, about uh, love, about sexuality, about politics, about religion, uh, about ideas that still obsess me. And, and when I get up in the morning, the first thing I want to do is to, is to, is to, to, to write. And I was writing this morning, and I'll be writing every day. There isn't anything else to do with your life. Do you still keep a strict discipline? You go to work every day, even if you don't know if what you're going to do that day? The, w the day wouldn't have any meaning. There wouldn't be anything else to do with the day. It would be awful. You'd get up and you'd shuffle around and you'd read the paper. <laughs> and then what would you do? You wouldn't have any, any passion. It's your, it's, you know, being an artist is a, is, is, is a, it's a, it's a gift in a way, but it's also a torment. To be an artist is to be obsessed with your work, to have never finally said it. And then, you know, to be quiet after that would be impossible. So I'm still writing, I'm writing stories, I'm doing writing a, a film of mine is being shot at the moment. I'm trying to finish a novel. Um, and I'm working on other ideas that I'm trying to develop. Um, it really is an obsession. It, and and, and in, in so far as it is an obsession, you can't teach that. You have that or you don't have that. I, if we, we, I teach uh, uh, writing at the university, and you can see, and the writers sometimes look at you and they say, can you inspire me to be a writer? And you look at them and you think, are you mad? You either have that passion, that desire to do that, and to carry on doing it and to want to do it better, or you don't have that, and that is fundamental to being, to being an artist. You have that first, and then you find things to say. You know, you sit there, you make a space, you go to your room and you work, and you, in the room you find something. You said it yourself that a writer, an artist, should be a terrorist. This was before terrorism became, it became so unfashion <laughs> an, over, unfashionable. an overused word with, with, with another meaning. Do you N still feel like that? I think it's very, no, I think it's, uh, a t a t terrorist is a misleading word, but I do think the writers are devils. And there are writers all over the world who are forbidden, who are in prison, who are considered to be to be dangerous. If you go to China, you go to many Muslim countries. Um, there are writers who are being uh, persecuted and tormented. There's something about speaking and about speaking some sort of truth that is absolutely necessary and very, very dangerous. Speaking in a family, um, speaking to yourself, uh, um, 
and speaking politically is very, very dangerous still. Um, and uh, uh, it has to be. The writer, the writer has to put himself or herself in, in, in that position of saying, you are obliged to say what other people will not or cannot say. Salman Rushdie, when he wrote the Satanic Verses, I've always argued this, was speaking for Muslims. He was speaking the doubt that Muslims w were not allowed or couldn't bear to, 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 to think for themselves. Um, he was, as it were, sacrificing himself on behalf of, uh, uh, of other believers. And that's, that is a crucial place of the writer. So it's not as though now we live in an open, transparent world where we no longer need truth tellers or writers. The world, in fact, is getting worse in that sense in terms of who is allowed to speak around the world. When you look at China and certainly you look at Muslim countries, it's really dangerous to be an artist. To be an artist in Pakistan, for instance, which is where my family live, <coughs> is horrific. I was in Pakistan earlier this year, and my, one of my dear cousins teaches post-colonial writing in Pakistan. And, and I said, well, uh, and, and I made a speech at the beginning of this festival, and I talked about Rushdie. And she said, oh, you're really brave to talk about Rushdie. I said, why? She said, in Pakistan, we don't even mention his name. She said, if you go into a shop and ask for a book by someone, Rushdie in Karachi, they won't have them. They're not allowed to sell them. The shop will be burnt down. It's really dangerous to be an artist. And I was horrified by that. And when she teaches post-colonial writing, she goes from Naipaul to, to Zadie Smith, and there's no mention uh, of, of Rushdie at all. So if a writer is a terrorist, it's because the writer has been put in that position um, by, by the, the, the authorities who, as it were, do not want to hear what he or she has to say. So the, devil, the writer has always been a devil in a sense, and it's a kind of playful and amusing thing to say, but I, I do believe that to speak is a very difficult thing to do and is not getting easier in the world. So I think we really have to think about this and take this, take this seriously, the necessity of speaking and how people, in a sense, we could imagine a future, a sort of Chinese future in which you can, be, uh, you can have a very high standard of living and, 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 and benefit materially, uh, but where people don't have uh, free speech, they can't criticize the government. And that is a very conceivable uh, uh, future. And I do think that we are very lucky in certain parts of Europe and in Britain where we can speak, but I think it's a bubble and it's contracting, I think, in terms of the rest of the world. In the Black Album, you were already speaking about discontent among Muslims. Do you think, <coughs> uh, now in retrospective, could you have, uh, have you managed 9-11 or, uh, or the, uh, the bombing attacks in London? And you wrote something about Tavistock Square as well. That well, very the, moving. The, 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 uh, I became interested in so-called fundamentalism uh, in the 80s after being in Pakistan, where my family then were, were terrified of, of Islam, not radical Islam, but any Islam, because it, it's not an ideology that encourages speech. And then after the fatwa against Rushdie, I got very interested in kids who were in Britain. Um, indeed, who were near my house in the colleges, schools, some of the mosques, and so on. Uh, and they were proto-terrorists. I mean, some of them went to the Yemen to, to train and so on. Um, I'd grown up among, you know, my mates were, all my friends were Trotskyites and Maoists and so on. But these guys that I met in the 90s were really serious. They really did want a revolution, and they could bring a revolution, they believed. You know, you don't need a lot of people to bring a revolution. Revolution. The Russian Revolution was brought about by, you know, a tiny number of people. So they were very serious, and I was very interested in, in how it was that people whose parents came to Britain in the 50s and 60s, you know, wanted to blow up significant, you know, monuments and and and, and destroy free speech and so on in Britain. So I began to write the Black Album, My Son the Fanatic, and and, and other stuff. I mean, in My Son the Fanatic, some <coughs> of the things you know are quite prophetic, and and would happen. <laughs> But uh, speaking of politics, you, uh, you have been anti-Thatcher, and then uh, I don't think you're very sympathetic to uh, Tony Blair. And now uh, we have, again, a conservative uh, government in the in, uh, United Kingdom. Uh, do you still feel any interest in, in politics whatsoever, or uh, do you, how, how, how do you uh, evaluate uh, this whole uh, crisis in Europe, the austerity measures? <coughs> Because we were bound to, for, you know, um, happiness and the end of history. And all of a sudden, here we are in the middle of, of one of the, great, uh, the greatest Western crises of all times. 
Yes, it would be a real shame. It would be a real shame because it seems to me that there are certain values that are represented in Britain, France, Portugal, and other European countries to do with democracy, to do with free speech, to do with art and culture that are very significant. Um, and you know, people in the Muslim world, for instance, see those values as being profoundly important for, the, for themselves, the fact that you might listen to people, that uh, there may be uh, equality for women or for gay people and for other minorities, that you can make a society that's multicultural, for instance, as we have done in Britain. So these values which are being attacked by, as you put it, the new austerity or by the collapse of the economic system, you know, and the return to fascism in Greece and so on, and, and perhaps in other countries where there was previously fascism like Spain, I think that this is a, 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 a real danger to, to, to enlightenment values. So I am very concerned, very, I'm very angry about that. And it seems to me that the, 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 there are, are, are artists are crucial in this and keeping these, these, these values alive and going. What was your uh, relationship to the establishment in terms of class warfare, integration, uh, uh, during your uh, career? Uh, did you integrate? Did you become assimilated? Do you feel uh, do you feel English these days? Do you feel multicultural? Do you feel how? What has happened to the uh, to the boy from Bromley? <laughs> well, when I grew up, we were packies. We were we were outsiders. You know, when I grew up in in, in the suburbs in the 1960s, the neighbors would say to me, "Where are you from?" They would say it to you all the time. There were big existentialists in Bromley. They'd say, who are you? Where are you from? And you'd say, I'm from, you know, I'm from that house over there. And they'd say, no, no, where are you really from? And you'd say, well, I'm really from that house over there. And they'd say, no, but where, who are you? Where do you belong? And you'd think, fuck, who am I? Where do I belong? What am I doing here? Who am I? And it would really, as, as they say, do your head in. You had to think, my God. Why don't I belong here? What's wrong with me? Why am I different to these people? And after a long time, and be, when I began to write, it occurred to me that it wasn't me that had to change. It wasn't me that had to sort of fit into British society. We had to change Britain, and we had to make a multicultural society, which in fact we have done, a society made up of people, all of whom are different to each other and from different places and speak different languages and so on. So you have a patchwork world in which, you know, you have people have multiple identities. And that was a really good idea. And Britain, in some sense, has been a real va in the vanguard of establishing that kind of new society. And you walk around London now, and you see that London is truly multiracial and truly multicultural. You know, there isn't a, and you can see that actually has happened in the last few weeks with Obama, that Obama now has begun to realize that America, is, there's a new America that isn't a white um, uh, authoritarian America anymore. It's made up of minorities too. And clearly that's the future. So when uh, you're a kid in the 60s and you don't fit in, you realize you have, it takes a long time for you to realize that there has to be a political solution to this. And it's not to do with you, you know, changing yourself in order to fit in, but the, the world has to change to make a place for you. And that's a fairer world and a better world, but it's a big deal to make that world. But writing gave you an identity. I needed an identity. You know, I was fucked when I was 16, 17. I didn't have an identity, I didn't know who I was. I was a hippie, I was an Indian boy. My father was an immigrant, I was an outsider. You know, I couldn't, I didn't want to, uh, couldn't get on at school. Most of my friends had become skinheads. The rest of my friends uh, had become punks. Everything was really falling apart for me around then. So I decided to become a writer and that sort of held me together. It still does actually. At the same time you were growing up in London during the 60s or you were 70s, feeling on the 70s. 70s. Yeah. Yeah, you were a child in the 60s. But uh, uh, anyway, it was uh, uh, you know pop culture time. Music, uh, the videos, uh, and you integrated that into your writing as well. Well, pop and later punk in the 70s was our culture. You know, most of my friends were in bands. Some of them uh, became photographers. Other w others of them went to work for Vivian Westwood. Um, and so all the kids that didn't fit in at school, you know, went into pop and went into so-called alternative culture and so on. We found a place through that. So the suburbs was both really dull and really stupid and full of 
you know, really bovine people. On the other hand, there were some really interesting kids. It was really sparky down there because kids were in bands, that you, you know, you could get records and so on. So it was a mixture of the most terrible boredom and really interesting people. Do you think your breakthrough was My Beautiful Laundrette or your first novel, The Battle of Suburbia? I think My Beautiful Laundrette, which was a big hit and it was a big surprise to me and a big shock in terms of the way it changed my life. But looking back, I can see, I think now, that My Beautiful Laundrette and Midnight's Children, um, which was 81, a bit earlier, eight, yeah, 82, 81, really changed the cultural landscape in terms of the way Britain was seeing itself. Culture in Britain had always been white for obvious reasons for a long time. And then there was this film and this novel and this novelist Rushdie too. And uh, other artists then began to emerge from minorities and you began to see that the, there are other people in this culture who you can hear from, who can speak. You know, the thing about pop is that it was people from the margins who were speaking British pop, you know working class people, like, well, lower middle class people like the Beatles and, 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 and the Who particularly and so on. And then you saw the same thing happening in film, you saw the same thing happening in the novel, that it's the bit that's repressed, it's the people that you don't hear from who are interesting. And once you hear from them, you suddenly see the country in a new way. So there was that hinge in the mid 80s uh, of My Beautiful Laundra and, 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 and Rushdie where a new Britain began to emerge of dancers, actors, writers, comedians, novelists, and so on, who came from so-called minority cultures, and who had things to say about the country that were interesting. But you said yourself that um, uh, everything came easily into your hands, as opposed to your father who wrote, uh, or tried to write uh, novels his entire life, or stories, or plays, and he, he never had any measure of uh, success, or, or was published. Um, do you think it was that easy? Because, I mean, you have a career spanning 30 years, a lot of work put into it. When you say it's, it it's was not, easy, it, it's not, it's <laughs> what not do you it, mean by easy? It's not easy in the sense that you just sit down and write something good. You can't do that, and it would be a madness to think that. I mean, you wouldn't want to sit down and write something good. You want it to be difficult, because there has to be a real friction between you and the material, right? But it was easy in the sense that the world opened up that the world was waiting for that. When we made My Beautiful Laundra and later I wrote The Buddha of Suburbia, it's as though people thought, oh, you know, um, he's beginning to speak for something that we need to hear from. It, it's really that, it, it wasn't forced. It wasn't, the world wasn't unwelcoming. And that was luck. I mean, sometimes that happens to happen to John Osborne, for instance, who looked back in anger, for instance, suddenly thought, oh yeah, this bloke stands for something that we, that we all understand is emerging. That's luck. You don't make that, but you have to be in the right place at the right time. And you can see it with other artists, Adie Smith, to a certain extent, the same thing happened to her. What, what, what kind of writers did influence you when you started? Well, I used to read a lot when I was a kid. There was nothing else to do. As my son said to me the other day, I said, why don't you read a book? He said, well, there's lots of other things to do that are better. He said, in your day, there wasn't anything else to do but read a book, and it's true. You know, when you went to bed in my day, you went to bed and read a book. You didn't have any other electronic gear. Um, so I read a lot. And I, um, yeah, I read all the time. I read, but the, what I was mostly influenced by, I think, was probably um, French writing, Sartre, Camus, Simone de Beauvoir, that stuff, and then by American writing. Um, by um, Salinger, uh, Philip Roth, Norman Mailer, Richard Wright, Ralph Ellison, that generation of mostly hip, black, Jewish writers who were writing in a, in a contemporary voice and later on people like Tom Wolfe, Hunter Thompson and so on. But I really felt that these were hip, modern, young writers who were writing about a new, you know, emerging young America. Um, and I thought, why can't we do this in Britain? So when I wrote The Buddha of Suburbia, I wanted to write about what we were wearing, the drugs we were taking, the parties we went to, and being an, uh, an Indian boy, or uh, uh, an ethnic kid, an outsider, putting all that stuff together in the way that I thought that American writers had done. Mm -hmm. You spoke of James Baldwin, I think, and many, many years ago I interviewed him. He was in Lisbon, a very nice man. And he said, you know, you, you have no idea what <laughs> how difficult it was for me because I was black 
I was black when blacks didn't exist, more or less what you've said about yourself uh, in, in the UK during those days. And on top of that, I was gay. Didn't help. I was a gay, gay black writer. You are not a gay uh, uh, writer, but you wrote a story, a love story in my beautiful laundrette between uh, uh, two gay men. How popular did that make you <laughs> with uh, your own, uh, uh, with the Muslim community? Uh, and, and yeah, I mean, they were pretty pissed off <laughs> because they thought, you know. Because it's even if Baldwin was a long time ago, you weren't in, in a better position. Well, they thought there were very, very few. In fact, there were no films ever made about Pakistanis at all. So they thought, here's a film about our community, and there we are. We're, 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 we're being shown by this man as being homosexuals. And they were really fed up about this. And there were demonstrations in New York against the film that I used to go to, in fact, on Sundays. <laughs> and they used to march around and around and around. And I found it quite amusing. That this is obviously long before 9-11. I'm talking about 1987. And they used to say, oh, there are no gay Pakistanis, and it's an outrage. And I've still got photographs of all the posters and stuff. Um, but you know, if you're an artist and you're not annoying people, you're not doing it right. You have to annoy people. I always say that, a, that an artist is, is loved by the public and hated by their families. 